There we go. Now we are recording. So hello, everybody, and welcome to the webinar. This is the December webinar, and we are going to learn <clears throat> how to teach writing to engineers. Uh, yeah, uh, Noel is here, and he um, presented this material first at the summit back in Orlando, and it was very well attended, and um, people were just crazy about it, and I got some emails. We need to get this guy as a webinar, so... Um, here he is. Um, Noel, I think everybody can read your um, accomplishments on the Eventbrite, but um, if you want to highlight some of this stuff, you are definitely an author as well as a technical writer, and um, you've got 34 years. Uh, yep, 34 years. Which is amazing. Yep. Uh, I've worked in several industries. I'm now working for an oil and gas services company. Uh, I've written some several articles that have been posted on uh, industry magazines in 2017. My work on the uh, history, chronological history of the Baker Atlas won best of award at the summit. Uh, so I'm you know, quite humble that you know, I've been asked to present today because I think the information that I have will be a benefit. I know it certainly was beneficial to the folks who were at the summit. Well, congratulations on that um, best of show, and um, yeah, we are definitely we're definitely excited to hear what you have to say. Okay, well, uh, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to provide information that can help you teach technical writing to engineers. Now, I offer this information for your consideration. You can take what you like, you can do what you like, uh, but I think based on the responses and feedback I received at the summit, it was very useful from the comments that I received uh, to the people who attended the presentation. And speaking of the summit, before I started my summit presentation, I asked two questions. Here's the first one. I wanted to find out from the people who were in attendance, about 50 people, who actually led a technical writing training for engineers. And for, for those who had said they had done this by raising their hands, I asked them another question, trying to find out what challenges they faced. And they gave me a, an avalanche of answers. However, three of the answers were very interesting because they paralleled many of the things I experienced. They claimed the engineers uh, had short attention spans. Many of the engineers did not concentrate on a subject or a task for long periods of time. Another common response, when the engineers were asked to write, uh, many of them exhibited bad grammar, bad punctuation problems, spelling mistakes, verb tense agreement problems, all kinds of fundamental writing problems. And another uh, response that came up very common was this. Uh, the engineers reacted negatively to disorganized information, poorly composed presentations, and unclear directions. Now, I had these challenges and many more, but after leading several training sessions, I learned some lessons that helped me deal with these challenges. But let me give you a quick background detail so you know the source of these lessons. One of the remits that I have at Baker Hughes uh, is I have traveled to many Baker Hughes offices internationally to lead technical writing training sessions. Uh, here I am in Abu Dhabi and then in Sella, Germany. And it was very interesting. And if you ever get a chance to travel, by all means do so. In addition to the international staff training, however, I've led training sessions uh, to many offices in continental US. And over a span of about five years, I've led 54 of these training sessions and uh, learned quite a lot. But before we go on, I want to make a def give a definition, establish a definition. Most people who attended my training sessions were indeed degreed professional engineers in various fields. However, many attendees, although they were not degreed engineers, had advanced science degrees. They're very intelligent people very knowledgeable in their subject matter. So to simplify things, uh, today for our discussion, I'm going to consider all these individuals as engineers, even though they don't carry the shingle that says, I am an engineer. The simple goal of my training sessions to them was to help the engineers write abstracts, which are submitted then to oil and gas conferences. And if the abstracts are accepted, then the engineers are asked to write a technical paper, which then is included in the proceedings for the particular event. So first the abstract and then the paper. 
And my goal was to help them write these abstracts and papers for these oil and gas conferences. At the conclusion of each training session, I distributed feedback forms on which the engineers wrote their evaluations and suggestions. Here's a stack of just a, a small stack of some of those that I collected. After I collected them, I carefully analyzed the information that it contained. And from this analysis and my session experiences, I identified what I call 10 lessons learned. Now at this point, I wanna stress one thing. These lessons learned are not only for the documents in my training sessions. They're not applicable only for those, no. They are not only for the engineers in the oil and gas industry. In fact, these lessons learned should be applicable for technical writing training sessions for many different types of documents and for engineers in several industries. So it's uh, pretty much universal what you're going to hear today. Today I'm going to start by discussing these lessons learned as they relate to a specific training session. Several lessons learned apply to what happens before the session, during the planning and preparation phase. The bulk of the lessons learned, of course, apply to what occurs during the session, and there's one lesson learned that applies at the end of a typical training session. So let me start then with the lessons learned as they apply to the time before the session, the preparation and planning phase. Here's lesson number one. It might seem like too elementary or simplified, but it works. You've got to understand who you're, you're, you're teaching. And my analysis was two parts. First, I wanted to determine their characteristics, the characteristics of a typical engineer. So. Uh, I began looking on the internet, searching for engineers' characteristics. I interviewed several of the engineers, asking them several questions and got a lot of information from that. And of course, the experiences in the classroom taught me a lot about their characteristics. So very quickly, I developed a good perception of what the basic characteristics of an engineer are. Now, in my analysis, some of the uh, response results were enlightening. And some of them were somewhat humorous. For example, on the internet, I found a slide, a graphic that an engineer produced and placed on his blog. This slide is his assessment of the basic characteristics of an engineer. When I saw this, I was particularly amused by uh, some of these things, but especially the no social skills. Many of the engineers that I deal with have fairly good social skills, but the point is well made. This gentleman, and it was a man who wrote this, uh, has his perception of the characteristics of an engineer. Well, on the serious side, I also discovered many other characteristics that engineers have. For example, I discovered that many engineers are very detailed individuals. They will perform, if necessary, they will perform detailed activities and tasks to fulfill their projects. Consequently, for the training, the technical writing training, the engineers would want to know details to follow for writing their documents. I also discovered that engineers are very logical people. They want to perform activities that make sense, something that's progressive, so to speak. As a result, for the training sessions, they would want to know clear and logical steps to follow for writing their documents. Most engineers that I came across are very focused individuals. They can concentrate on a task very easily, but only for a limited number amount of time, only for a limited amount of time, and I'll speak more to that later. Consequently, for the technical writing training sessions, I learned that the engineers want to obtain this information on how to write, what not to write, tips and suggestions. They want this all as quickly as possible. Of course, engineers are analytical. Uh, this common illustration, I think, conveys this characteristic. Uh, to the optimist, the glass is half full. To the pessimist, the glass is half empty. And to the engineer, there's too much glass for the amount of water. Engineers want to look at a writing task and evaluate the steps to perform it. It's inevitable. They will do that, but you can't stop them. 
They will analyze what they've been given to do. Engineers, by and large, are very organized individuals. They respond well when information is given to them if the information is itself organized. However, I discovered in surfing the internet, I found a slide that shows an engineer, unfortunately, who took organization a little bit to the extreme. Now, after I determined some common characteristics of engineers, I then moved on to the next part of my analysis. What, was they, what, what, what specifically did they need? Talking to them, listening to them in the class, I quickly discovered that many engineers were very concerned about writing, in this particular case, writing an abstract in a technical paper. When you talk to your engineers, when you do your analysis, you might also detect apprehension for the document or the document set that your engineers produce. Apprehension can be very uh, subtle. It can be very uh, showy. You, you'll have to look at it and find it yourself. The engineers, as I said, were apprehensive. Many of them had no knowledge of what an abstract or a paper should or should not contain. They, they did not know. So therefore, in the technical writing sessions, they needed an accurate explanation about these documents. The engineers also wanted, were looking for tips and suggestions and candid information that would help them write these documents. And you might also face the same thing when you try to teach technical writing to your engineers. I also discovered many engineers had not written a lengthy technical documents since their college days. Yes, they've written emails. Yes, they may have filled in report forms, that type of thing, but a lengthy technical document, very, very few of them have done that. Consequently, common writing mistakes I know would, knew would be a problem. So therefore, I knew that the engineers would need a refresher on grammar and punctuation and capitalization, et cetera, basic writing and writing skills. And you'll probably notice that too when you analyze your engineers. After I determined the engineer's characteristics and identified what they needed in the class, then I determined the second lesson learned. I developed an agenda to give them what they needed, but it was designed for their characteristics. Very short, sequential, to the point, logical, organized. They responded to this very well. In fact, the reason they did was because it appealed to their characteristics of being logical and organized. The takeaway for you is when you develop your training session agenda, it should also be direct and simple and apply, supply what the engineers need. For the lesson learned number three, I focused on the materials. I produced the highest quality materials that I could. I bound them in an organized manner and I placed them on the tables before the session began. Most of the training sessions that I led were in session, were in class, uh, classroom type sessions. And all the material was ready to go. You're looking here at different ways of binding. On the upper right, there's a spiral, there's a uh, binder, uh, ring binder. On the upper left is a spiral bound. In the bottom center is the notebook portfolio you can get at Walmart or any place. The point is, Produce the best quality, the best looking documents that you can, bind them and have them ready and ready to go on the tables as the engineers walk in the room. I've tried handing out the materials during the session. It's not a good idea. It takes Not only does it take time, but it's chaotic. It distracts from the lesson. So have the engine information ready to go. And the engineers in this particular case really enjoyed it because they could sit down and start perusing the material right away. If you want to teach your training sessions digitally and do not want to use the printed matter, for example. On a couple of uh, sessions that I led, I distributed uh, thumb drives, USB thumb drives, on which all the material was stored, one at each chair. And as the engineers came into the room with their laptops, they plugged the, lap the USB drive into their laptops, and I started 
uh, the, the session right from that point. So you can do this digitally if you wish. However, there's some social issues. Lesson number four. The sessions that I taught had between 15 and 20 engineers in the room. Very few of the engineers knew each other. I knew very few of them and almost none of them knew me. In other words, it was a room full of strangers. I discovered that asking questions at the very beginning was useful not only to break the ice, so to speak, but it was also useful to obtain some information about the engineer's expectations to the training. I asked the questions, a couple of questions to the engineers. For example, I wanted to find out who in the room has experience in writing an abstract or paper. I asked them to raise their hand. And to those who indicated by raising their hand that they had done this, I then asked a follow-up question. I said, okay, tell me, was the task of writing an abstract or a paper difficult or was it easy for you and why? And I received some very interesting responses. The, the reasons why some thought it was easy. Some people thought it was very difficult and there were various reasons for each. From the answers they gave me, I got some insight into the challenges they were facing uh, for the training session so that I could supply for them. I also asked this question. Again, I asked them to raise their hand if anybody had recently read the paper. And I said, all right, for those of you who have read a paper recently, tell me about it. Was it well written? Was it poorly written? Did it contain some issues? Give me your opinion. And we went around the room and I was amazed, very pleasantly surprised to see how, how capable these people were of analyzing somebody else's paper to tell everybody in the group what was, what, what was done well on it or what was done poorly on it. Now, after all this was over, I stopped and I reassured everyone in the class that the training session that I provide would give provide the information that they could use when writing their abstracts and papers. I didn't want to scare anybody away at this point. We had talked about challenges, challenges, issues, issues. I wanted to reassure them, and you might have to do this in your training session too, to reassure the engineers that what information you're going to give them will help them in their attempt to write their document or their document sets. And so the questions that you ask, you should create around the document or the document sets that your engineers produce. The next lesson learned, again, dealt with the session materials. It might seem like elementary, but I took the time before we started the class and I held up one of the binders, or in this case, the portfolio, and I said, all right, everybody, open your ring binder, open your folder. Here's what we're gonna do. I'm going to explain to you everything that's in this doc, everything that's in this folder, everything that's in this ring binder. And I would pull it out and I say, this is the abstract sample. This is the quiz. This is the checklist. This is the so-and-so. And it's in the right pouch or it's in the left pouch or it's in the third tab or it's in the fourth tab. I went to great detail to explain to the people what was in their materials and where they could find it. This activity significantly decreased confusion when later on, I asked the engineers to remove items during the training session to pull them out so that we could work on them. Another benefit of this activity was it, it gave me the opportunity to explain how some of these materials, the engineers could use them immediately on writing their documents. For example, I had a checklist. I would explain to them, this is a checklist. You can use it immediately to writing your abstracts, your papers, et cetera, et cetera. Now this technique appealed to their characteristic of being organized and being detail oriented. If you go the digital route and do not have paper oriented materials, a suggestion that, that I have <coughs> is you would display the material on a screen or on a monitor, the folder structure. The reference material would be in one folder and you would open up the reference folder and you'd look at all the files, perhaps opening them up and explaining what you have. In other words, methodically going through the structure to explain to them what they have on that USB thumb drive. It's, it will save you an enormous amount of confusion uh, during the session. The next lesson learned dealt with the methods of teaching. I can't stress this in, uh, too much either. You have to be prepared to use various methods. 
to deal with the engineer's interest level and to help them understand the information. Because as I had mentioned before, engineers can be very focused individuals. They can focus on something very well, but only for a certain amount of time. I'm going to describe a few of the techniques that I use and perhaps you can modify them for your training sessions. In some sessions, I grouped the engineers into teams of two or teams of three. I then provided them with an exercise. I handed out uh, previously written abstracts or I asked them to pull them from the their, their document materials. On the pouch, I said, pull it out. You have a, several abstracts that have no titles. Each team would then collaborate, read the abstract, and then their goal was to write a title for the abstract. It might sound elementary, but the title of an abstract is a very important component when the abstracts are submitted to the technical review committees at these conferences. The first thing that anybody reads in an abstract is the title. And the title must be concise. It must summarize what's in the abstract and give some indication of a, uh, uh, of a goal that has been met, a challenge that has been met. So after, distribute, after asking these people to do this, the groups would get together. I'd let, give them some time. And then I'd go around the room to each team and say, okay, you had the abstract that had no title that dealt with hybrid bits. Uh, what was your title that you came up with? And they came, they, they told me the title. And we go around the room. Again, I was very pleasantly surprised to see how well a, a team of people could work together to produce a task. By the way, this photograph was taken in Muscat, Oman. And I think the guy on the right there is kind of cheating, trying to get the answer from his uh, buddies, but it was a very successful exercise and the engineers really enjoyed it. Another technique, find somebody that you can invite as a guest speaker. What I did, I located a Baker Hughes employee who was an experienced writer or author. And this individual also was a member of several conference technical program committees, the people who review the documents. The engineers in the class really appreciated this individual coming. They, he mentioned about what should or should not be in an abstract, some of the problems that authors have, some of the suggestions he would make to get their abstracts accepted, and so on. The engineers appreciated greatly the candid and informed tips and suggestions and even cautions that this speaker provided. Here's another technique that I used on occasion that worked very well. Sometimes you can teach people with humor better than you can being straight faced. I produce a list of writing errors to avoid. And at the appropriate time, I, I asked the engineers to pull this out of their information packets and we would go over it. It was a very pleasant change of pace. And so I would suggest that you consider using some humor as you deem appropriate in the technical writing training sessions of your, of your own. However, the significant uh, portion of most training sessions dealt with PowerPoints. In every session, I used a couple of PowerPoint presentations for several reasons. I knew the engineers would accept these. They were, they were anticipating them because they're accustomed to PowerPoints and they could focus on the content for a time that I could direct. However, as I mentioned, the engineer's characteristic of being focused had its limits when it comes to giving PowerPoints. My experience indicated after class, after class, after class, that the interest level or the attention level of most engineers dropped significantly after about 25 minutes. I noticed that after about 25 minutes, they started fiddling with their iPhones, to, doodling in their, in their ring binders, distracted, looked like they had that glazed look on their face. So the 25 minute limit was what I imposed on my PowerPoints. All my PowerPoints were 25 minutes or less in time. I would suggest that you consider this also for your uh, presentation. Now, when it came to PowerPoints, I use some techniques that you might want to use that will help the engineers absorb the information quickly. Use more images. Use text sparingly. 
like the slides I am showing you today. They're not text heavy. People remember images much better than they do text. And this approach helped me retain their attention and convey the information quickly. Another technique I use that I would highly suggest you consider, sequential information display. Here's an example. What you're looking at here is a timeline. It shows that events uh, distribute a call for abstracts. They tell everybody in the world that we want abstracts for the conference. And in this particular case, they issue this information six months before a due date, an abstract due date. And the timeline is marked off into one week, one day, and the abstract due dates. The point I'm trying to get here is that I want to impress upon the engineers how important it is to submit their abstracts before the due date. So I would display what you see here to them. And then I would click my presentation tool. And the little image would display of a stack of abstracts. And I would tell them at a typical conference, approximately 25% of the abstracts submitted to the conference are submitted between six months before the due date and one week before the due date. Then I would click my presentation tool again. At a typical conference, approximately 25% of the abstracts sent to that conference are received one week to one day before the abstract due date. Now you know what's coming next. At a typical conference, approximately 50% of the abstracts that are submitted to that conference come on the abstract due date. And I point out to the engineers, do not do this. Your chances of having your abstract accepted when it's submitted on the due date, much poorer than if it were submitted earlier. So this sequential a display of information appealed to them because it was logical and it was detail oriented. It's a good technique to consider using, but you have to be brief and to the point. Another technique you might want to use in your sessions, exercises. But again, you've got to limit the amount of time. Approximately 25 minutes, as I discovered, is about the maximum amount of time for a given exercise but it dealt with their characteristic of being focused and analytical. A very successful and useful exercise that I used was what I call common errors. I distributed sheets, actually didn't distribute them, they were in their packets of information. I say, pull it out. This is a just common errors, writing errors. And each of these sheets would have mistakes. They would have for punctuation problems perhaps, sentences with wordiness, subject verb agreement and so on many of these problems <clears throat> illustrated in the sentences and i would instruct everybody i want you to go through and to the best of your ability correct the sentences and i give them appropriate amount of time about maybe 15 or so minutes and then stop and then i would show them on the monitor the correct answers this was very very effective the people really enjoyed this in fact i received comments after some of the classes that they wanted more things like this. This appealed to their characteristics of being logical and analytical. Now all this, with all these exercises, really led up to the next lesson learned. I, what I did, I asked them to pull from their, their packets of material the example of a well-written abstract and the example of a well-written paper. I then pointed out in, in detail specific examples in the abstract and the paper why they were well written. We'd go through it and I'd point out, see, this is what the author did and this is why it's well written. And we do it again and again and again. In other words, I was showing them quality documents and explaining why they were quality documents. This appealed to their characteristics of being analytical and detail oriented. I would encourage you to try to do this to the document, using the document or document sets that your engineers produce. But then on the other hand, lesson number eight, after learning and explaining to them what was well written and why, I was going to give them the opportunity to show me what they had learned. So out of their packet, I asked them to pull the example of a poorly written abstract. And I told them, I want you to play the role of an editor. I want you to look at this and mark it up. And I also told them, by the way, that this particular abstract was an abstract that was produced by one of our competitors. 
That was all they needed. They, with great relish and enthusiasm, when they heard it was produced by one of our competitors, they began to mark the living daylights out of it, so to speak. And after giving them some time to do this, then I would go around the room and ask, what mistakes or issues did you find? It was amazing. The people had learned a, a great deal just from the learning, uh, the previous lesson learned about looking at a well-written abstract that they could incorporate immediately in the, analyzing this poorly written document. And this, of course, appealed to their characteristics of, again, being analytical and detail-oriented. Now, of a more global nature, the lesson learned number nine deals with the human aspect. And I would suggest strongly that you do this. During the in-session exercises and at appropriate times during the session, I provided sincere compliments to the engineers when they responded to questions, when they gave answers, they gave it an honest try or the effort that they made to do something. Give them the positive reinforcement right then and there. In fact, at the conclusion of the session, at the very end, I made it very clear that I really appreciated the time that they committed to come and attend this class. Because remember, many of these engineers delayed work on their projects so they could attend the training session. And I made sure that they knew that I appreciated the time that they spent in the class. So this brings me to the very last lesson learned. Get feedback. In their packet, I asked them to pull out the feedback form that I had composed. Very simple. It has, as you see, a uh, check the box section at the top with a, with a scale of one to five and then two sections at the bottom for what I call free form responses. Everyone, every person, every person in the room filled one of these out and dropped it on the table as they left the room. Now, most every person filled out the top section, about half the people filled in information in the bottom two sections. But even so, I received many useful comments and compliments in these free form areas. So develop your own feedback form for your training session. All right, that concludes the session. I experienced, discussed how my experience and analysis taught me 10 lessons learned. So let me summarize the points for the lesson for you. You've got to determine in your own mind and be certain the characteristics of the engineers that are receiving this training. You've got to understand it. They're not going to change because you're teaching the class. You've got to deal with them where they are. Identify exactly what they need based on your document or document sets. Find out what these engineers are going to need to know. Give them what they need in terms of content and do it in such a way that supplies what they need, but design it for their characteristics. I would encourage you to follow some of these lessons learned when you lead your technical writing training sessions to your engineers. And if you had trouble copying down all the lessons learned, there they are. So you can take a look at them right now. And that uh, concludes my presentation and then I'm available for questions right now. And we have uh, some questions in the chat box. Let's see. There's a lot of agreement in the chat box. Let's see. Um, so Kelly says, um, hello, uh, totally agrees. Engineers like to learn by application. So, and then uh, we thought your um, humor section was funny. There were a couple of smiley faces in there. Good. Uh, I think the attention span that Laura says, I think the attention span is similar for all people, not just engineers. Uh, that 25 minute mm -hmm. target is pretty universal. Um, Laura also wants to know, do you consider copyright when you're selecting your images? Yes, Okay. very much so. Uh, you got to be very careful about that. In fact, all the images on my slides here have uh, the have the uh, source and low, little tiny print at the lower right hand corner. <laughs> yeah, a lot of yes. them were taken by you, I noticed too. Yes, some, yeah, many of them are taken by me. But yes, you should consider the copyright. Now, the advantage also that I have is that uh, I'm a photographer and I can take many of the images, sure. But you do have to be sensitive to the copyright, yep. Sure. And let's see, Kelly says that um, uh, 
Kelly says, when I teach, I like to mix the lecture and the application exercises. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, getting, getting lots of agreement. And then I loved the 25%, uh, 25%, 50% for the, the due date. Um, and a couple of people say that they're definitely in that group. <laughs> Let's see. Sarah says, do you ever incorporate video into your training? No, I have not yet. It's a it's a good idea. Uh, I'm going to have to incorporate that one of these days. So I think there's a few videos uh, either on the on YouTube or elsewhere that I've been looking at that I can uh, probably insert. It would be good for a uh, not for a significant portion of the training session, but as an additive, something small to reinforce a message. And Laura wants to know, do you ever work with non-native speakers of English? Yes. I guess a lot uh, of your populations that you showed us. Yes, the uh, they are they are English familiar but not fluent. They know many of them know three and four languages, especially when I went overseas. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, uh, some of them I, I was amazed at what they could do. But the point is, yes, many of them are non-native speaking individuals. You have to be very careful. The humor that you use has you have to be very careful mm -hmm. because other countries have different perceptions of a humor, but it still works because it's, you're giving them a task to do. And uh, it, it was helpful when you had a group of two or three working together. There was always one or two in the group that did not speak English very well, so they could lean on the expertise of the English speaking person. So it, it worked out pretty well. There was nobody left out in the dark. Terrific. Jennifer wants to know, do you find different characteristics for different age groups? Good question. I have not analyzed that, but sitting here thinking about it, uh, the older the individual, the more likely they are to want to deal with a uh, instructions, uh, like a checklist. Mm. Uh, the they're, they're more likely they are wanting to deal with analyzing something in great detail. Uh, the younger ones, not so much. That's a good point. I'll have to do a little more analysis on that. Yeah. Uh, Brenda wants to know, why are the engineers apprehensive about writing? They're for, well, I shouldn't say they're forced to do it. Uh, many of them are required to do so because it's on their remit uh, for their performance evaluation. Uh, they are apprehensive because they have never done it before and uh, they don't really know what to do. I'm more or less the lone ranger, so to speak. There, there's very little training. Uh, in how to write a technical document very well. The Society for Petroleum Engineers, the SPE, is a, is a very big organization, and they have some very valuable information, but it's, it's, you got to know where to get it, and most some people don't. So they're apprehensive because they're required to do it. They've never done it. They're not sure what they need to do. Hmm. So Leslie wants to know, have you had to sell the need for tech writing training to engineers that may not think that they need it? A few individuals came into the class because they were compelled by their supervisors to do it. And you can tell who those are. Mm. However, uh, when, when I got into the class itself and we got into the exercises, then they, most of them began to warm up to the idea that this is not some example of fr frivolous activity. This is something that they can use. So the vast majority of the people who were there were there because they chose to be, but there were a few who were there because they were compelled to be and did not want to be there, but some of them warmed up to the idea. Uh, Bernadette wants to know, where did you get your ab your good abstracts and your bad, where did you get your materials at? I also I have found, a question. Sure. I, I have a friend who works at a couple of them at Baker Hughes who sit on the review committees for some of these com conferences, and I asked them, can you give me some examples of some of the well-written abstracts? <clears throat> and they said, okay, I can give them to you. I can't tell you who the authors are, and I can't tell you uh, who the companies are because it's privileged information, but I can give you some of the files that are what we consider well-written abstracts. Nice. So I got them from there. And Bernadette wants to know if there's a good market for this type of training, uh, like as a paid-for service as opposed to an in-house service. Possibly. Um, I have learned, a quick answer is possibly. You'd have to be very good at 
trying to stress find a find a, a tangible reason something that's going to a, a, accrue from doing this on the for the benefit of the company and for it can be difficult to do it uh, the biggest benefit that I've learned is when you teach the engineers how to write well they write abstracts well the more the abstracts are accepted they generate more papers papers are a very good promotional and uh, uh, a promotional piece for a company at conferences so it's to for the company's benefit to have many more papers at a conference now I agree that for a person who wants to do this for a type of a living or for a side job the biggest uh, challenge you're going to have is proving that what you are giving them the increased knowledge is going to be a tangible benefit somehow for the company now maybe it will be fewer mistakes on the part of for user calls and user support if that's that type of document if the documents are marketing related um, perhaps it's a better, more sales, something like that. But you've got to show management at these companies by having the engineers know how to write better, you're going to see these benefits. Yeah, Bernadette just typed in to demonstrate the ROI, right? Right. Uh, and now, Alan, um, you have microphone rights. Did we um, cover where to get good sources of the real world examples? Um, he's asking for suggestions. Uh, yeah, I think you did. I didn't notice the uh, earlier question. Thank you, Alan. Okay. In fact, everyone, we have you all have microphone rights if you'd like to speak up. So we do have another question from or uh, question from Leslie. Um, she says, since they're engineers, do you also teach how to write uh, feature specs for products? Oh, and is your training for engineers working with hardware, software, or something else? Uh, no, I don't because uh, that is out of my purview for one thing, and mm -hmm. and on top of that, I don't have time to branch off into something else. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, is it, there's a need for it? There is a definite need for it. But uh, there are some, in, at Baker Hughes anyway, there are some groups that deal somewhat in some training in something like this. But for the technical papers and the abstracts, there was nothing. And so I jumped in to fill the void. Um, this is Leslie again. So do you manage a, a team of uh, technical writers? Uh, and and what, are, what is your area um, working with? I have no team. I'm a sole contributor. I guess that's the term that's used. Uh, I work and report to a vice president. My job is to make sure that the engineers, and not just engineers, all authors, can uh, use a particular document management system that we have, that they can uh, understand some things about writing abstracts and papers, and I also help uh, edit some of their documents. And currently, I'm involved as uh, I was talking to Vicki earlier, I'm currently involved with generating a brand new document management system uh, to replace the old one. So no, I've, I've been the uh, lone contributor for about nine years now. Wow. There are other technical writers, but they don't, they don't work in my area. I originally reported to marketing, but now I'm reporting to a vice president of engineering. Just because I'm curious, because I, I come from an oil and gas world in, in the past. Mm -hmm. um, uh, where are you physically located? Houston, Texas. Oh, are you hiring? Uh, <laughs> I want to come back to Houston. Yeah, not, not that I know of. In fact, we're I'm, undergoing reorg right now. Yeah, I'm kidding, but, but I would. Mm -hmm. The uh, one benefit that I wanted to mention, I mentioned that you should try to achieve some sort of tangible benefit over time. Uh, because I've taught so many classes and so many individuals in the classes, I've been tracking to a small extent the number of abstracts that have been produced by these individuals, tracking the people who attended the class. Did they submit abstracts before they attended the class or did have they submitted any abstracts after they attended the class? And in general, uh, in, the classes uh, helped out to pr to increase the number of abstracts submitted by 20%. So 
it, it makes a difference. The, the additional training makes a difference. Yeah, that's good that's feedback. Um, and how about how many of those then were um, accepted by the conference? Don't know. Don't know for sure. That's more difficult to track. My guess would be uh, probably about thirty percent. Have they uh, also asked for your help while they were preparing their abstracts and papers? Yes, but I don't have time for that. <laughs> yeah, they want what they want is a technical writer to come and write the abstract for them, but. <laughs> No, that's not going to happen. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. No, 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 no. I don't have, I, literally, I don't have time for that. Uh, but that's what they want. So Todd DeLuca, I can't believe he's not actually speaking up. Um, he says, nice job, Noel. Great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Quiet today. Yeah, you're quiet today. Hi, Todd. And so Brenda has an, Brenda Stevens has an interesting question. What would an English composition and scholarly research writing professor need to do to be successful as a technical writing instructor? Well, beyond the obvious of trying to give information quickly, trying to deal with their characteristics, like we've spent some time talking about here. I, one of the biggest things, because you're experienced in composition, what the papers, the technical papers, Many of them falter and stump, the authors stumble because it's not a logical sequence of information, not a logical flow. And I can't go into specific details here now, but they start talking about one thing and then they move on to another thing that's not related to the first thing. In other words, it's very, very poorly organized. Uh, in addition then to the grammar and the punctuation and the perception of the need that they have to or learn things quickly, you would need to impress upon these individuals uh, information flow, logic, outlining, I mean, un underscore that, outlining a paper, making sure your, your arguments, your information comes through in a logical manner. And many papers are, are just asked. Well, after submitting a paper, sometimes the papers are reviewed by the technical program committees and they're returned to the author saying, rewrite this. So <clears throat> that can be avoided by someone who's skilled in teaching individuals how to compose a document properly. So there's good overlap there. Um, Sarah sa Sarah asks, what is the biggest challenge that you had to overcome by teaching engineers to write? Mm. Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> Let me think. Uh, a pre the willingness to try mm. on the part of the engineers, the willingness to try. I can tell them how to write. I can tell them what they should do. I can tell them the grammar. I can tell them how to organize. I can tell them how to write sentences, titles, and I can tell them the techniques. But if they're not willing to try, I can't touch that. And some of the engineers, they don't want to try for various reasons. And so that, and in the class too, in a couple of instances in the class, some of the engineers, for example, they don't want to try to do the in-class exercises. And it's simple. It's, I mean, it's not that tough, folks. They don't want to try. So motivation on the part of the engineers is one of the biggest stumbling blocks or hurdles, I should say, or maybe challenges that I've run across. However, I will say this. There are people out there. In fact, I'm surprised that nobody asked this question. Is there a difference in the societies as far as the receptivity of the information you provide them? Most definitely. Mm. I have learned very quickly that individuals who are from uh, Asian countries, uh, uh, African countries, uh, Indian countries, uh, those who do not have English as their first language, or if they do, it's a multilingual country, multilanguage country. Individuals like that are very appreciative of the efforts I expend to help them read. Not so much the Americans. Now, yes, some do, some are very appreciative, but it's a challenge. The culture makes a big difference. When I taught the classes in Kuala Lumpur to the Baker Hughes people, when the class was all over, I said, thank you very much, have a good day. They all stood and gave me a standing ovation and lined up eight or nine people deep to thank me personally. Wow. 
That's never happened in America. So there is a difference in culture. So uh, Leslie has a sort of a related question. She says, have you had any disruptor or difficult types in your classes? Fortunately, no. Fortunately, no. Uh, the, the, the people are more mature than that. And the people, the, there's a few people who really didn't want to be there, but they, they did not take their frustration out in the class. They, some of them left, uh, but none of them fortunately took their frustration out of the class. Todd wants to know if the training was required by the company. Some was. It depends. Uh, it depends on the manager and the executives, how, how much they want to emphasize the production of abstracts and then technical papers. If it's a very key, if it's important to them, then they mandate that their employees and their performance plans uh, have a requirement that they must attend X, X number of training sessions, including technical writing uh, during the year. Uh, it depends on the executive motivation. Volunteers versus voluntolds, right? Yep. Yep. Okay. Of course, now at Baker Hughes, one of the one of the stimulants, one of the things that promotes technical papers, is if a person produces a technical paper, and if it is presented at a conference, they receive money. There's an author award. That helps. Yeah, money talks for sure. Yep. So Brenda wants to know, um, or she's just making a statement. She says, sounds like a person who has composition and English as a second language background could do very well as a technical writing instructor. Yes, because you have the sensitivity to, or potentially have the sensitivity to look at things from the perspective of a person who does not have English as a first language or who knows English, but not very well. Yes, it sound, that would be very helpful, yeah. being composition oriented and ESL background. Yeah. Um, David has chimed in. He says, uh, when people attend a class that they don't want to attend, they are less attentive to the yeah. instructor. That's for sure. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Yeah, that's unfortunate. <laughs> Sarah wants to know if you get a You're cut good. of the. No, uh, no. Unfortunately, no. I do this out of the love of, from my love of my heart. And I enjoy doing this. This is a rush. This is a rush for me to do this. Teach these classes. Well, you clearly have a passion for it. And you look very happy in the photos. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So you're clearly enjoying yourself. And Leslie says you certainly taught this one well. So. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And Todd says the travel is a nice boat bonus. Yes. When we had money to travel, it was great. I mean, I went to, I've gone to Kuala Lumpur. I've been to five Middle Eastern countries. I've been to Germany twice. I've been to Canada once. Uh, it, yes, it's great. Uh, you, you never appreciate your own country as much as when you leave it and come back. <laughs> All right, everybody. Let us give Noel a big round of applause here. Thank you. <laughs> and I'm going to stop the recording because I would like uh, – yes, we're getting lots of applauses typed in. Oh, standing ovation from Leslie, yes. <laughs> All right, I'm going to stop the recording.